Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest LPL Market Signals podcast. Jeff Bookbinder here with my friend and colleague, Jeffrey Roach. How are you today, sir? Happy Monday. Happy holiday shortened week. Yeah, happy July 4th to you. Here we are on the 3rd of July and uh, looking forward to a little bit of a, a reprieve and uh, glad to do the podcast with you. I was out in Boston last week, so missed uh, missed the morning call, missed some of the activities, our normal Monday activities, but glad to be here. Yeah, well, good to be with you. Um, by the time folks listen to this, they would have already, presumably, already celebrated 4th of July holiday. So happy birthday, America. We don't think we're going to get this out Monday. It's probably going to be on uh, Wednesday. So hope everybody had a good fourth. Um, we will uh, begin by saying, yes, it is July 3rd, 2023. Um, as we're recording this, here is our agenda uh, for today. You see, we're going to start off, as we always do, with a recap of the markets. And we certainly have had a really strong finish to the first half. Um, we're then going to talk about the inflation data last Friday, the core PCE. That is certainly why, Jeff, our LPL chief economist uh, is great uh, to have on board today. We've got the capital markets green shoots. It's kind of a patriotic theme. This week's weekly market commentary highlights some of the green shoots with IPOs, uh, mergers and acquisitions, just in general, celebrating the uh, innovation in the U.S. and the dominant global capital markets position that we still have and probably will have for uh, a very long time. And then as we always do, we will uh, recap or we will provide the week ahead economic calendar. It is jobs week, uh, but certainly the ISM matters too. We just got the ISM manufacturing data, which we'll talk about uh, at the end here. So uh, let's get right into it, Jeff. Boy, this bull market just keeps on going. Uh, we had a, a really strong week last week for stocks. You know, two weeks ago we were down and people thought, including myself, frankly, that maybe that was the start of a little bit of a pause. Well, stocks had other ideas and uh, this bull just kept on going higher. We were up more than 2% last week on the S&P. Uh, you see here that all the sectors for the S&P were higher. Uh, that closed out a really strong June, up over 6%. A strong quarter. The second quarter was up over 8% uh, percent actually total return. And then a strong first half up almost 17% total return. So uh, certainly the question people are asking is, well, there's two questions. Why are we up so much and can it continue, right? Uh, so Jeff, I want your take on this. You know, my take is that the market was up last week because uh, market participants were pricing in a higher chance of a soft landing, right? We got a series of pretty resilient uh, economic data. Uh, I don't know if you have other ideas, but um, maybe I'll start there. What would you say to that? Well, yeah, I think you're right that in some ways we're basically saying as investors and sitting here and making those portfolio allocation decisions, we're saying, you know, the 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 risk of the Fed breaking something is becoming less and less likely. And of course, when we see, say, breaking, I think we're talking about, you know, a great financial crisis uh, kind of scenario. So, you know, perhaps a short and shallow recession might not quite get into that category of something breaking, uh, something blowing up. And so, you know, folks are saying, you know, the economy is slowing. There's no surprise there, but it seems like there's still a little bit more uh, pent up demand being released for um, services spending. And uh, I think there's still this really interesting tale of two economies when it comes to real estate. So on this chart here, Jeff, you're showing, you know, look at that 5% number on, on the week uh, and, you know, for the for of course for for the year to date numbers, it's not not quite as strong for real estate. But I think in in more recent times, you're seeing pretty pretty nice level of activity uh, units under construction, amount of construction spending going for particularly multi gen and multi family activity. A um, little bit, of course, uh, unknowns on the commercial side, office space, the hybrid work environment. What's going to happen there? But you know, real estate. I think investors are saying it's worth dipping our toes in the water and putting on a little more risk. Yeah, certainly not a sector that LPL research recommends right now, but something that we we have to watch 
uh, no doubt. I I think the uh, the major theme coming out of the sectors, which really hasn't changed in months, is that you have the economically sensitive cyclical areas doing better, right? Tech certainly in that boat. Uh, industrials have been doing fairly well recently. Consumer discretionary, right? Those are the leaders, and the defensive sectors like utilities, staples, healthcare, they're just not attracting interest on a sustained basis. So this is a sign, you know, just like higher highs and higher lows, it's a sign that this bull market is actually real. Uh, and it's not just a bear market rally that's going to quickly fade. So, um, you know, no change on the sector side, which is which is good. Um, I guess the other point I'd make here is that we have some pretty decent gains out international, but international's had a hard time uh, keeping up with the U.S. And part of the reason for that is that tech strength, and that's the U.S. innovation uh, that we'll get to here uh, in, in just a little bit. So um, let's let's move on. Um, I mean, the in terms of the outlook for the um, for the market here, we still think we can go higher, but we do think we need a little bit of a breather in the short term. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. We're overbought, uh, and this would be a natural place, especially during the summer holiday season, uh, for um, for a little bit of a pullback. So we'll we'll see. Um, maybe that starts this week. So let's um, do a quick look at um, you know, bonds and commodities from last week. So I think on the bond side, you know, we had this push up in rates, responding to some of the good economic data that we saw. So, you know, in an environment where we're still worried about the Fed, Jeff, I might expect stocks to fall as bond yields rise. We continue to hear hawkish commentary out of the Fed, out of the ECB, and other central banks around the world. So, you know, to me, that points to a real resilient uh, bull market here in, in the face of of rising rates. What do you think? It, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a, a period, really, this this reopening post pandemic uh, finding balance kind of uh, regimes. Uh, it, it's been uh, an interesting time where where investors are saying, you know, we know we're not going to live in an environment with such low rates, you know, for, Right after the great financial crisis, going into you know 2019, uh, you know, you're thinking about how unusual that that period was. Rates, uh, you know, were, were so low for so long, and then of course, you know, post pandemic, I think investors are saying it's worth taking on the risk, despite rising borrowing costs, because you know inflation is eventually going to ease and and hit that uh, target that the Fed wants. In fact, that might be a a segue I just set myself up for for the commodity uh, section on that slide. We just talked about fixed income and rates, Jeff, as you introduced. But you know, bring that together with the commodity portion. You look at the grains uh, performance over the last week. Um, part of that is is playing off of you know what happened maybe earlier um, in the month. But clearly, you, you have to say that as grain prices ease. Uh, pretty significantly, you know, that's eventually going to flow into uh, perhaps less inflationary pressures on the foods categories. And that's certainly going to be good news, particularly for lower income households. Absolutely. The commodities complex has been, uh, you know, an area where clearly inflation is making good progress. Uh, we still have inflationary pressures in other areas of the economy that we got to work through. But uh, that is certainly um, uh, good to see for Fed watchers. Uh, so let's um, take a quick look here at the S&P 500 chart. We have, you know, again, the series of higher highs, higher lows. But you could just see from this chart that um, certainly we look a little bit overbought in the short term from a technical analysis perspective. And as we've been saying, when you get valuations you know, close to 20 times uh, and you couple that with higher interest rates, now the 10-year yield making a, another potential run toward 4%, we think the trade-off between stocks and bonds Looks more balanced, maybe even tilting a little bit toward bonds. So we still recommend a slight overweight to fixed income, funded from cash, in our rec in our tactical asset allocation, and then on the equity side, just a straight up uh, neutral. So um, let's talk more um, inflation and, and economy, Jeff, with this next section here. Um, the, I mean, the Fed's already been hawkish, right? I mean, we've already heard dot plots, two more hikes. Uh, a July hike is pretty much fully priced in. So, you know, maybe that the worst of the Fed repricing is is behind us. 
right? So maybe the question for you is, you know, does this um, inflation data that we got last week or the series of resilient economic data points, you know, variety of data points, you know, jobless claims are good, durable goods, pretty good. We got some good housing data, right? Does, does that collection of economic data points uh, sort of offset the good inflation number or relatively good inflation number we got Friday and start to scare the Fed a little bit more? Well, I, I think we're given all that data you just referenced and, and some of the other um, important factors, I think we're in a period where this data dependency that the Fed likes to talk about it may not be uh, that helpful for investors, right? Near-term volatility when you know you have one uh, dovish voting member talk about, hey, I don't have my mind made up for July. And then you have uh, the majority very hawkish you know, and on the committee. And so this data dependency, I think, puts really a lot of pressure on investors to say, okay, what what data is going to be the most um, relevant and most impactful for voting members? I think the key to take away here from this chart is just uh, overall, as you read from from left to right here, October of last year to May of this year, looking at the fact that you know inflation is easing from from a number of different vantage points. Uh, the the circled uh, cell that I have in the bottom right is what we got on Friday, and that's that core services X housing. Given the fact that you know sixty five plus percent of uh, households are homeowners, uh, still have a, a a fair amount of households that are impacted by rents. Uh, it's, it was interesting just that the Fed had focused on this uh, several meetings ago. And that's one of the reasons why I added this to the to the overall inflation dashboard. But y y you can't argue that inflation is becoming a lot more um, uh, comfortable, you know, still above the 2% range, but uh, it's going in the right direction. And that's really what matters for investors, particularly. Uh, yes, we're still way above the 2% level, um, but we're going in the right direction. Yeah, and our our house view, Jeff, on uh, core inflation by the end of the year is around three and a half percent, right? So that that's getting pretty close to where the Fed should be comfortable, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's right. I, you know, so I, I think w another factor that's really important for investors to think about is, you know, the Fed cares about real Fed funds rate. So taking that that nominal target of the upper and lower bound, that range, subtracting out inflation rates, and we're seeing a real, a positive real Fed funds rate. And that's going to give the Fed a little bit more um, opportunity to, to have months like they did just uh, this past month in June, where they had a pause. We call it the hawkish pause. Uh, and and but the, at least it gives them a little bit of leeway to say okay let's let's pause and let's wait and let's uh, let's watch uh, you know as of today here we are you know on on July third as you mentioned recording it you know the uh, the options markets and and uh, other ways and tools of measuring the likelihood of a Fed hike you know puts it puts the July hike at close to ninety percent probability so you know most likely the hawkishness of uh, the committee will overpower those that are dovish like Austin Goolsby from Chicago and uh, probably see another hike in July. But uh, these these easing inflation rates are certainly something that, um, you know, the Fed will will welcome. Yeah, and we got a good prices paid number in the ISM manufacturing report. So uh, another piece of evidence that inflation is moving in the right direction. You know, the, the worry, uh, Jeff, that you've pointed out a number of times is is with services inflation, right? So is is there still a lot of pent up demand for services activity in this economy or, or are we kind of at the point where we've, we've normalized? Well, spending is still below trend in terms of services. So this is something that I wrote about right after the report Friday morning. And uh, you look at that that orange and blue line, it's just levels of, of real spending. So it's adjusted for inflation. Uh, so we can, you know, accurately compare uh, one year to to the other year. But uh, you can see the blue line there, consumer spending on an inflation adjusted basis is below trend still, which is which is really quite amazing. Now, granted, you, you'd say, OK, what about goods? Well, 
the other the other story holds there. Uh, consumers ha- are are way above trend. They've pulled forward a lot of demand for the good spending, uh, and so you know maybe have a little bit more uh, pent up demand to to release for services spending. Look at travel plans. Uh, I think that might be one practical area uh, for you know people to look at uh, to to show and illustrate that case. But uh, we're still a little bit below trend, so maybe have a little bit more of that uh, spending surge happening in services. But once you get to that trend line, maybe uh, you know when we get to that normalizing uh, mean reverting behavior, maybe that's when we finally see a recession. We're, we're arguing for the more uh, short and shallow, meaning less than the post-war average of 10 months, uh, something shorter than 10 months, uh, and and perhaps not quite as deep given the fact that that banks are a little better capitalized. Well, I should say a lot better capitalized relative to the great financial crisis. So, uh, yeah, the recession call, a little bit frustrating, right? We, we started out uh, the year um, and ended last year thinking that you know, recession would look like it would be uh, emerging sometime mid to late summer. Now it's probably mid to late uh, fall and winter time period. It's all on that services spending. Well, I, I hope that call is is wrong again, <laughs> and then we could push it <laughs> off even further. Certainly, that's the best time to be wrong, right? When you're predicting a weaker economy and you get surprised uh, to the to the upside. Uh, I also want to say, you know, in terms of services spending, I sure hope that. Airline travel is normalized because I don't think the system can handle much more airline travel <laughs> than we're getting uh, over this uh, July 3rd, uh, July 4th holiday uh, week for sure. So, so as, you, um, yeah, as, you, as you know, Jeff, just a uh, you know, personal anecdote, we thought we were going to be missing the uh, the crowds in Italy if we traveled in the month of May over there instead of the month of August. Right. Everybody, you know, everybody knows the yeah, August is a terrible time to visit Europe, you know, generally speaking, right? So crowded, so hot. Uh, it was crowded in May. Uh, and so, you know, there people are still making up for lost time. <laughs> it, it's it's quite amazing. Had up demand for travel, clearly at work. So uh, everybody uh, travel safe uh, this week, and hopefully uh, things will be a little bit smoother than they've been the last few days. Um, so let's turn to the... Um, the IPO, M&A, capital markets world a little bit. I mean, we don't usually talk about this, but I think um, it's interesting to point out now because, well, first it's America's birthday, right? And so uh, celebrating our record of innovation, ingenuity, entrepreneurship, all of that uh, is is great. We have the best, strongest capital markets in the world, uh, certainly, uh, and that should be celebrated. But you also have, you know, what has been a really sleepy capital markets environment for the last year or so. IPOs, you're seeing the chart right here. IPOs have been way down, but we started to see some green shoots, right? We've got, well, the, the, um, you know, we've seen an IPO from a fast casual restaurant recently. Uh, We've seen a couple of others and the pipeline starting to fill up as, um, you know, executives of these private companies uh, start to see, maybe a more favorable uh, economic environment in the coming months, right? You have to really predict what the environment's going to look like in the future when you go public. It's not just about what it looks like today. So, you know, this chart, it's still way down. IPO activity is still way down, and it's not going to move meaningfully in the very short term. But it looks like uh, we're seeing some green shoots that 2024 could be a decent uh, year for um initial public offerings. And then uh, let's go to the merger and acquisition activity. You know, it's the same story. It's way down, right? But, you know, the environment for M&A is getting better too. We we don't have to worry so much about the banks, right? The regional bank stress is largely behind us for now, hopefully for good. Uh, And then we got past the debt ceiling and, you know, the economic data has suggested that maybe we're climbing a wall of worry you know, companies may be more comfortable making a long-term commitment uh, either through acquisition or merger. Uh, so even though M&A activity is down about 30% uh, year over year, maybe the second half you see some pickup and maybe you see more deals uh, next year. So uh, this is, I think, just another sign of many that this is a legitimate 
uh, bull market, not just a false bear market rally. What do you think, Jeff? Well, I, you know, certainly, um, you know, cost of borrowing, you know, versus uh, opportunities for firms to put some cash to work, you know, that's certainly going to be driving a lot of the decisions. I think just going back to, you know, maybe that a uh, little bit of that July 4th patriotism, you know, it's it's interesting when you th- when you think about the stability of U.S. markets relative to international, you know, counterparts, you know, you see that, uh, you know, investors do value uh, the stability, the legal uh, complex in this country, the protection for intellectual property, uh, the opportunity to to earn uh, a reward on the risk you take as an entrepreneur. Uh, that certainly uh, keeps me bullish on the U.S. long term. Uh, I think that's a you know another angle to think about in terms of uh, you know the IPO slide and some of the introductory comments you made uh, on this topic. But yes, a little bit uh, a little bit of a, a patriotism coming through our weekly market commentary this week. Yeah, as we celebrate the first three trillion dollar market cap, <laughs> right? Uh, that's uh, really amazing. Uh, that uh, market cap for for Apple is is over th- uh, three trillion. So uh, yeah, U.S. innovation. This is why tech's doing so well. It's around innovation, whether it's you know artificial intelligence or cloud computing or mobile or whatever the innovation is. Uh, it seems like the U.S. leads with each uh, subsequent wave and. Uh, Certainly, that's uh, you know why we would expect over the long term for U.S. equities to outperform uh, the rest of the world. So, uh, good good segment there uh, with the July Fourth theme. So let let's uh, talk economic calendar, Jeff, and then we'll we'll wrap. Um, I alluded to the ISM prices paid component, right, which was disinflationary. Now, part of it is because the manufacturing sector is weak. Totally get that. But nonetheless, it's another example of something that's kind of real time, not totally, but, you know, pretty timely uh, economic data in the ISM because it's a survey about what people are experiencing now or what they expect to experience in the very short short term. Um, So but I think people are really going to focus mostly on the jobs report on Friday. Yeah, so uh, the. The report on business for manufacturing always comes out a couple of days before the report on business that focuses on services, which clearly services as a, a larger component of our domestic economy. But you know, one of the things I highlighted uh, and shared with my fellow stack uh, team members, our strategic tactical and asset allocation committee, uh, is is the fact that you know as the the global economy slows. You know, new export orders are falling. That demand downturn is certainly going to be a a major factor in cooling off the inflation story. Remember, last year was all about supply constraints. As supply constraints were easing, you know, we were making the connection between that and you know, just uh, container traffic and uh, the cost of that that traffic coming from uh, country to country. Now things are shifting and and the updated narrative really needs to include the fact that slower consumer demand is going to uh, be a major factor on inflation. Hence, the prices paid component there uh, that you highlighted for today uh, came out at 10 a.m. Eastern uh, today on the third. Uh, And then, of course, we'll get uh, the services component there on the sixth. But it's all it's all jobs on Friday. Um, Right now, there's still quite a a bit of consensus thinking that uh, June numbers are also going to come in pretty hot. Uh, And that's, you know, that's going to probably convince even the doves like uh, the Austin Goolsbees of the world, that uh, maybe maybe there is that one more hike that needs to happen. But uh, unemployment uh, participation rates, payrolls, uh, those are all embedded in that uh, very big and very important uh, June labor market report. We'll get that 8.30 Eastern time Friday morning. Yeah, so we're we're not going to get, you know, any evidence that the economy is sliding into recession in Q3 uh, from any of this data. But certainly if, um, you know, if this data is too hot, you'll start to see folks increasingly price in maybe a second rate hike, uh, one after the July hike, which is very likely to happen. So, you know, that said, markets are forward looking. And so we're probably seeing some of this latest rally is the market saying, you know what, whether it's one more hike or two, 
the end is pretty close. And, you know, after Fed rate hiking campaigns, you tend to see stocks grind higher, not dramatically so, but you tend to see stocks uh, grind higher and then you tend to see bond yields fall, right? So if we get lower bond yields, more evidence of falling inflation, end of the Fed rate hiking campaign, you know, maybe you, you could add to uh, these first half gains in the second half. We, we're not going to be out on a limb. You know, our um, mid-year outlook will be published next week. Uh, and you'll see uh, some fairly cautious uh, comments about about the outlook, just because, as Jeff just mentioned, we do think within the next six months, you're going to start to see this economy roll over a bit. And, uh, yeah, that's just a tough environment for stocks to make a whole lot of headway. Uh, but the the evidence we see that this is a real bull market with some some oomph behind it uh, suggests that, you know, frankly, our call for recession could be a little bit too conservative and our call for maybe the U.S. equity market to just make a little bit more headway in the second half. That could end up being uh, too conservative, too. We'll we'll have to uh, have to wait and see. Uh, but no doubt some folks have been, you know, dragged off the sidelines here. You hear the uh, acronym FOMO. The fear of missing out. <laughs> Certainly, a lot of bears have reluctantly uh, come back into this market and helped uh, help push it higher. Maybe a little bit too high in the short term, but uh, certainly uh, we'll 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 take what we can get. And, and the strong first half certainly we can we can celebrate it here uh, at least for uh, for a little bit <laughs> before we eventually yeah. get that pullback that we know always comes at some point. So, well, um, any I closing comments, Jeff, before we wrap? Yeah, just, um, you know, it, the challenge, of course, is, you know, forecasting models have never had to deal with, you know, a period of time where uh, the world was closed, right? I mean, you know, it, we're, we're still still recovering. Here we are in 2023. I've, I've said this to you, Jeff, and our, our stack members. It's, it's amazing to think that, um, you know, the, the March 2020 shutdown uh, that that lasted just a little bit the the reopening was so so sluggish and and convoluted that um you know models are having difficulty uh forecasting and and managing what it might look like uh after you know after a global shutdown it, it's just it was clearly a time that um models have never had to deal with before uh hence hence the reason why we're saying okay well, recession well pent up demand what happens you know what happens if the markets continue to rally and and we're in this modest zero percent right no growth at all maybe not a recession but somewhat of a no growth period uh either way uh as you said earlier jeff it's it's so important to remind you know our listeners that you know markets are forward looking it's it's now about 2024 2025 right <laughs> there's never uh there's never a dull moment in our in our world we need to start you know hel uh, kind of helping craft that narrative as markets are are uh willing to to grind higher higher lows higher highs um, 2024 might not look too bad after all. Yeah, and then the next time we're with you, we will uh, probably start talking about earnings season a little bit, right? Q2 earnings season is not too far away. Uh, I believe um, I believe we, we get some bank reports. Maybe it's July 14th, somewhere around there. Uh, that's going to be a, the next test for markets to see if these gains are, are justified because if we see uh, you know, inline or maybe worse earnings for second quarter and estimates come down uh, meaningfully for the second half. That's not necessarily our base case, but if that does happen, uh, then, um, you know, that could be the time where you see the markets maybe take a little bit of a breather. Uh, we'll have to wait and see more on that in uh, two, three weeks. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, I'll say it's time for me to go fire up the grill, Jeff. Let's start. <laughs> My July 4th holiday, got some family in town, which is which is always fun. Uh, but for those of you listening, you have already probably fired up your grills and celebrated America's birthday. So happy July 4th uh, to all. Happy July 4th to you, Jeff, uh, and our producer, Neil. Uh, hope uh, you guys have a great, great holiday. And, uh, and, and thanks for all that you do for the Market Signals podcast and for uh, LPL Advisors and all of our clients and the public out there.